Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when they make the playoffs. So you got a big hockey guy? Of course. I'd like to win the game. Okay, let me start uh, introducing myself. My name is Rebecca. 1940, that makes me 70 years old. That's when I was born. In a little town called Eagle Pass, Texas. A family. A ten, seven boys, three girls. Remember, my good farm workers, we used to go from Texas to uh, Michigan to Minnesota, Idaho, Washington, Wisconsin. And then we come back, and at the time, there was no migrant education, so we used to leave school. In April, we didn't come back until October. And we missed uh, school all the time. <coughs> so <coughs> that was the story of our life until uh, in 61, we came to California, a little town called Sanger, California, right outside of Fresno. And my mom liked it because it was work according to her. It was work year round. She decided to stay, and uh, at that time I decided that I had enough homework, so I <laughs> came to San Jose, 61. At the time, San Jose was a thriving community of 91,000, and I went to work for the Monte Canning. There were a lot of canneries here at that time. While I was working here, within six months after I got here, I got drafted by the board, by the draft board from Texas, so I had to go to Texas, San Antonio, and then from there they sent me to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, from Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then they sent me to San Francisco. And I was on my way to Vietnam when they were looking for somebody that knew how to type. I raised my hand, and they made me the company clerk, and they kept me in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I started to read. Started with the newspaper, then Reader's Digest, and then uh, I used to use the Reader's Digest at uh, section and on the vocabulary, and I started to carry around index cards with the vocabulary and pronunciation and definition. Every time I stop somewhere, I take them out. When I was in line in college, I take them out and go through them and learn. And uh, I managed to get out of city college with a C average the first year, and then the second year I was, uh, was an honor student. I came to San Jose State, graduated with honors, did a master's degree at San Jose State, graduated with honors. Then I got a fellowship to go to Stanford. And I didn't know what a fellowship is when I got one. When I applied for my PhD, they accepted me. And I, and I, when I got the fellowship, I didn't know what it was, so I had to look it up. And then I found out that they were going to pay all my tuition, my books, and my, my costs for, uh, for going to Stanford. And on top of that, they were going to pay me my salary, which I, was, I had been working at the, as a community director for the 4C Council here in Santa Clara County, and I was making $45,000 a year. So they were going to pay me $45,000 a year, plus all my expenses. And that's a fellowship. You know, they actually pay whatever you're making, they'll pay you that so you don't have to work. And you take leave of absence. I didn't know they had those kind of things. <laughs> I didn't know. And, uh, the founder of this college, Roberto Cruz, was from my hometown in Eagle Pass, Texas, and uh, he was on that committee. He was representing the Bay Area Bilingual uh, Institute, and uh, he was the one that awarded me the fellowship. And that's how I met Roberto. 
Este, so I did my doctoral degree in administration and policy analysis, and I came back to San Jose State. I taught there for approximately 30 years. I taught several years at Irving Valley College, and then I retired. In between, I did some work for community organizing for the Industrial Areas Foundation, and uh, then uh, I retired at age 60. And then I wrote my first book on this one. I've been doing research for about 11 years. I finally said that's enough, and I wrote this book, Joaquin Murieta. And uh, I proved that the uh, well, main thing is that they, they didn't kill him. They didn't cut off his head like they say that he actually died of old age in Sonora, Mexico. After I, I wrote that book, I, uh, a lot of relatives from the San Joaquin area I didn't know existed actually came to see me in common with than I thought. You know, as a young man, I had worked with uh, the, as a volunteer with the UFW for cutting grapes and organizing. And my father was a member of the UFW. He was still a farm worker in Sanger, California. He was a founding member of the UFW chapter in Sanger. So, you know, it was always very close to my heart. So when I did the research, I found out that the, the, this is the board of directors of uh, the UFW. Let me see if I can get, I don't know, this is on the wrong side, so I'm going to do it from this side. This is actually what it's to look for. This here is Marshall Gap. He used to, uh, he teaches, I think, in Yale now. This is, uh, I mean, this this is uh, Max White. It's the only black person that's it, but he's a farm worker. Like, this guy is from Bakersfield. He's he teaching at, at, at Yale University. He actually came to, to, to work throughout the state of California. All county employees, city employees, have their own union. He's the guy that started it. Nobody gives him credit. He still lives here in San Jose. He lives well, just before you get to Saratoga, but still in the city of San Jose. He's a good speaker. You should invite him sometime. And then there are others, you know, like uh, as a young man, I was recruited by them in 1961, became a member. They had some good looking women, that's why I went. <laughs> At the time, I was 21 and single, but. There were some good-looking women in that organization. <laughs> anyway, and I wasn't married people then. You did the right things for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the people that I remember, and I don't know if you know him or not, is the, just Delgado, who, who became one of the politician activists here in uh, San, Santa Clara County. He <coughs> was, uh, was one of those people as the Jose Eduardo Martinez, who became the director of the SEM program, mentor program here in San Jose. He was involved with that as the mentor by El Pinon. I myself was mentored by El Pinon as the El Gaza, who became a city councilman here from the east side. He was a counselor at Overfell High School at the time. He was mentored by, by El Pinon also. And then there was Rigo Chacon, Rigoberto Chacon, I mean, you call Rigo. And he's a newspaper, uh, TV uh, commentator or something, newspaper here in the area. He worked for Channel 11 initially, he got into trouble. You know, I remember he telling me, he says, you know, they want to fire me. Why? He says, because I say San Jose instead of San Jose. I said, yeah, yeah, they want me to say San Jose. And I, you know, I said, you know, I pronounce it San Jose. <laughs> And uh, we had a talk with a general manager, and they didn't pronounce it correctly. But uh, then he went on and worked. Actually opened the, the, the door, went inside, handcuffed them. And then they proceeded to take turns beating them up. And it was so bad that all of them had to go to be hospitalized. There wasn't one that didn't have at least one fractured limb. And there was all of them had fractured skulls. And it became known as Bloody Christmas. Well, they tried to talk, CSO tried to talk to talk the young man into fighting a lawsuit, police brutality against them, but the young men were afraid to <coughs> do it. So 
for two weeks later, this guy, Tony Rios, who was the president of the CSO at the time in Los Angeles, was picked up by the police officers and he too was beaten up. And he called his compadre, who had now been, he was an elected city council member, and he says, well, what happened to you? And he told him the story, and he got him out of jail, and then he filed the lawsuit. And he can be offered the same terms as this guy's. You know, it says, you know, you know, you can cop out to resisting arrest and uh, uh, an interference with a police officer's duty. You cop to those charges, then we'll let you go. We'll drop the other charges. And he says, no, 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 I'm going to fight you. And he won, the, he won the lawsuit. When he won the lawsuit, then the other seven who still haven't cop out to anything, they filed charges. And they also won. When they won, this was the first time in the American Southwest that Mexicans had filed lawsuits, police brutality, anywhere in the American Southwest, and they actually won. None had been won before. When people found out about this, they wanted to form CSO councils throughout the American Southwest. And uh, in the meantime, I got to tell you about this story. This guy, he's a German immigrant, came to the United States as a young man, and he got in, involved in working in a warehouse, a liquor warehouse, distributing liquor, and then he became a liquor distributor, and then he bought uh, a distiller, and then he started to make liquor. And all this. Um, so the, the CSO, how did it combat, like, there's a form of gentrification happened in a sense. As the valley started to grow, if you weren't educated or had some type of technological background, and if you were a farm worker, did that kind of push people out? Well, they, it, it did in a sense, you know, like at the time, the farm workers went moved to work in the canneries. And then when the canneries, when the farm left, and the canneries were moved to Stockton and Modesto and some of the other areas, because they wanted industry, then the new industry, the new assembly lines for the electronic, that became the new cannabis. You know, that became the new cannabis. And then they got into where they had robots and all of that, and then they don't need as many. Now you need highly technical people because now they don't, you don't look to it like that. My kid brother, when he got here as a high school graduate, he worked for IBM as an assembler for computers. They used to wire boards by hand. You know, you, that's, that's what they used to do at the time. They don't do that anymore. That's done by machine. You know, and uh, there was a lot of jobs in the beginning because a lot of that was done manually. And they had charts and you sit there and you said, this water goes here, they had color codes and all that, and that's what you did all day. Push wires to the board. And you did one board and then they would take it and they put it into the computer and they plug it in. And then somebody did another one and they plug it in. Computers were about half the size of this room at the time. <laughs> And I'm uh, the new uh, SGA president, so I just wanted to introduce uh, who's going to come up here and he's going to talk to you guys about um, a few books that he has wrote about the Chicano movement and how um, it affects. didn't come back until October. And uh, give you a few uh, stories of what, what is school every year in April. 
and I didn't come back until October. So I only went to school six, six months out of the year. So I was always very far behind. But at the time we were there, they would pass you from one grade to the other just because you were our age. So when I went to San Jose City College, I found out that I couldn't write very well and I couldn't read very well. And one counselor actually told me that I was not going to make it unless I learned how to read, unless I get learned how to write. So at the age of 25, I went home and I sat down and uh, to a pack of beer and uh, drinking it and I said, what, what are you going to do now? And I decided that I was going to try one more time, real hard, to learn how to read, to learn how to write. So mm -hmm. then I could. Beautiful beach is a beautiful beach. Here I am, Koh Samui Island, Thailand, in the Bay of Thailand. pages and uh, it was just a real bad book by, written by Frank Letta and, uh, and I knew then that I could write a better book but I hadn't written one and that's when I decided to start doing the research and then like, 10, 11 years later I came out with this book. I read that book. Is it good or bad? Yes. It's good. Gracias. After I, I, I read, after I wrote that, Three years later, I wrote this one because when I wrote the other one, people in the San Joaquin Valley that were related to Joaquin Murrieta gave me a lot of information, new information that I had not found in the first time. And a lot of it came from oral history. Es una tradición mexicana, you know, that los abuelos le platican a los nietos y los nietos le siguen platicando a los demás. And surprisingly enough, a lot of the oral history is very accurate. And they gave me a lot of stuff that I didn't know on Joaquin Murrieta. So I had to write this other book, Joaquin Murrieta, the second book. And then uh, after I finished with that, one of the things that, I, that had bothered me, because most of the things that happened to Joaquin happened right after the Mexican-American War. Yo hubo mucho robo aquí. At one time, todo Alta California, que se extendía desde ahorita California, incluía el estado de Utah, Nevada, la mitad de Colorado, parte de Wyoming, parte de Idaho, parte de Oregon, la mitad de Nuevo México, y este California. Es a huge state, Alta California. Well, the thing about it is that all this land used era de, de, de gente mexicana. Aquí en este valle había 15 ranchos 
que le pertenecían a mexicanos. Este, en esta área era parte del rancho, de, de, del rancho, rancho de Herba Buena, está un poquito más para el norte, este rancho La Pala, más abajito está el rancho de Berrieza. Estaba el rancho rinconada de, de, rincon, rinconada de los gatos, now you have los gatos. En el rancho Milpitas, no, esto sería Milpitas. Este, en, en Gilroy había rancho San Isidro, nada de joven Gilroy. Más para acá estaba el rancho Las Ánimas, y más más para allá estaba el rancho Las Uvas, de Uvas Meros, que le llaman ahora, se llama el rancho de las uvas. En all of these ranches used to belong to Mexicans. ¿Qué le pasó? Bueno, how he did it actually was legally, and they passed the law. Uh, se llamaba Civil Section 180, 180, 194 of the state of California. And when I was doing my research on Joaquin Murrieta, I always wondered, you know, why do you take a hardworking, honest Mexican and how do you make him a vicious outlaw that kills people? Well, he ran into Civil Section 394 the, of the state of California, which basically said, that if you have up to one fourth in the blood, you could not file charges or be a witness against a white person in a court of law. So if a white person, como le hicieron a él, le robaron <coughs> su dinero, le robaron su mina de oro, they gang raped his wife, they killed his brother, and they beat him up. All of that was legal. When he tried to file charges with the state of California, They told him, you know, according to Civil Section 94, you're part Indian, it is Mexicano. You know, you, it's legal. White men didn't commit any crimes. So when the settlers vinieron aquí, como dijeron que they came over in covered wagons and they cleared the land, you know, aquí en este valle, puro borlote, they came over and they took over the land and they killed the Mexicans. In fact, Kit Carson was in charge of the executions. Captain Fremont was the commander, and they killed all the families. No quedaron relatives. They now they no querían ni un heir. They killed the grandparents, the kids, los niños, todo. There were some berriezas que quedaron vivos. Pero todos los demás, los Ortegas, los Bojorques, los Ramírez, were the owners of this land, todos marcharon. And now they have free land to give out to the settlers. But you don't find that in your history books. So what I'm going to say to you today is basically don't don't look to the Anglo-American to write to write our history in this country. We won't have to do it. They already proven that. You know, and they're gonna lie to you. Like they did to me and they did to my son, and now they're probably gonna do it to my grandkids too unless we change some things. Este, when I learned about that law, then I had to go back and do some research on the Mexican-American War and why it started, and how it started. And I found out and I proved in the book, this book, basically that it was an intentional war, war started by the United States so they could steal the American Southwest. But they really wanted, they wanted some seaports in California and a land route to San Felipe, to San Fe, so that they could establish trade with Asia. Because in order to become a world power, they knew that they had to have international trade. And the only way to get Alta California, Mexico, They tried to buy it from Mexico three different times. Three different presidents refused to sell it. So they went to war, said everyone. And that's the way it happened. Of course, they won't teach you that. In this book, I proved and I showed how they did it. It was intentional, premeditated, and that's why they did it. After those three books, I wasn't going to write anymore. Este, un amigo mío came uh, visit me 
this guy in the middle. Se llama Gilbert Padilla, vive en Fresno. And he read my other books and he says, Humberto, I want you to write the story of CSL, the community service organization. And then I told him, you know, when I was a young man at 21, I had just come to San Jose in 1961. It was a small little community of about 91,000. There used to be a lot of orchards here. There used to be farmland between here and Campbell. There used to be farmland between here and Mitpitas. There used to be a lot of farmland between here and Alviso. And even farmland between here and Santa Clara. And a lot of farmland between here and Saratoga and Palo Alto. You know, there used to be a lot of orchards. Ya no hay. Ya los acabaron. Now you got over a billion people. It's grown a lot. But in 61, I joined CSO here in California. And I had come from Texas and as a migrant phone worker, and I liked California, y aquí estaba. And I was working in the canneries at that time. I was working in uh, Del Monte. The United States uh, Army drafted me in 62. So they sent me to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, to get my basic there, and advanced infantry training at the Fort Polk, Louisiana. It was called Junko Training because no se iba a mandar a Vietnam. And then they sent me to Oakland, California. When I was in Oakland, California, there was about 600 of us, this company. And we were supposed to board a boat the day afterwards. And then uh, the first sergeant came in and he says, who knows how to type? And I raised my hand. And uh, he says, come over here. And I came. And then I found, the next day I found myself in San Francisco in front of a typewriter. And I still thought I was going to go to, to, to Vietnam, but uh, they kept me there. They kept me there. No, my, my company went on to Vietnam. So when I found that out, you know, I actually felt very grateful. Somebody had interfered, and I actually said, nailed down, and I prayed. I hadn't prayed in a long time. I was uh, not necessarily a very religious person, but I was a Catholic. And uh, I wasn't necessarily a good guy either, you know. I, I, I did a lot of things that I shouldn't have done as a young man. But I thanked my God and I promised him that he allowed me to uh, survive this, this, in, in this one in the Army. That uh, I, I, would, I, I would change, that I would stop doing all the bad things that I was doing and uh, try to be a good man. So, in 65, when I found myself in Oakland being discharged, I knew I couldn't go back to Texas, so I stayed in California and I went to San Jose City College. And I enrolled there and I wanted to uh, become a, a math teacher. I always liked math. So uh, I went and I wrote this, this, this little pair, this little three-page paper actually on, on what I wanted out of college and why I was in college. And it came back to me and it had an F on the whole front page. And I was very disappointed and I was mad. Because in the corner he had written, you know, like on the corner he had written, are you sure your college material? And I waited for him at the door, you know, next to the door, and I waited for him and I said, Mr. Garza, you look upset. Yes, I am. I said, what do you mean by this? He said, oh, all oh, that. He said, I, I noticed I noticed that you do not write very well. You write your skills are atrocious. And I said, what does that mean? He said, that means they're very bad. I said, and, and your vocabulary is very limited. He said, and apparently you don't read very much either. He said, you don't have good writing skills. And to make it out of college, you need two things. Besides the discipline to study, you need to know how to read very well, and you need to know how to write very well. And you need those two skills, and then have the discipline to study. If you don't have those two skills, you're not going to make it. So, you don't have them right now. 
So I asked them, so what, 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 how do you learn to read? And how do you learn to write? Because I've been to school already, you know, I graduated from high school, you know, like, I'm supposed to know how to write and I'm supposed to know how to read. He says, well, that's not the case in most cases. He says, uh, some people do learn, some people don't. He says, the way you, you learn skills, it's like playing pool, he says, you need to practice. Or it's like learning to ride a bike. It's a skill, you need to practice. And if you don't practice, you don't get better. So, so you need to read a lot and you need to write a lot. So I said that and I decided, uh, went home, got me a 12 pack and uh, drinking the beer and I said, well, what are you gonna do now, dummy? And when you went to high school, I had a lot of fun, but I, you know, I didn't learn how to write and I didn't learn how to read because I was too busy chasing women and having fun with my friends. So, uh, now I'm 25 years old and I'm trying to decide what I'm gonna do when I grow up. So I decided that I was going to give it a good shot and do my best to keep my promise to my God. And uh, I started to read a lot. And I started to read like the old newspaper, or read all the old newspaper, the Reader Digest. I subscribed to that, I subscribed to Playboy. And this time I actually, besides looking at the pictures, I read the articles. I actually read the articles. And then I wrote, I kept a diary. And I remember and my first entry well, in the diary was uh, a daily journal, basically. And I said, you know, today I went to school, I enjoyed having coffee with my friends. And that was it, you know, that's what I wrote. Three months later, I was writing three or four pages every day. And the reason was that somehow in between writing on a daily basis, I had lost my fear. I've lost my fear of expressing myself in writing by doing it every day. And when I graduated from San Jose City, I actually had, I was actually on the honor roll. Transferred to San Jose State, I got a degree from San Jose State and graduated with honors. I did a master's degree at San Jose State and graduated with honors. Then I got a fellowship to go to Stanford. When I got the fellowship, I didn't know what it was. And I, and I thought maybe it was like a scholarship, and it is in a sense, but it's not. You know, they, they give you money for all your expenses on a fellowship. And at that time, I was uh, the executive director of the uh, 4C Council of Santa Clara County, and I was making about $40,000 a year on my wages. I was back in 74. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Stanford says, you know, like, uh, we will pay you. The fellowship meant that they paid me all my expenses, all the books, and all that stuff. And then they would pay me my salary. But I didn't have to work. I could take a leave of absence, and then they paid my salary from yet. Because at that time, I was already married, and my son was two years old. And I had a little daughter that had just been born. So I needed income to support them, too. And uh, I got my doctorate degree, came back, and I taught at San Jose State and at Evergreen Valley College for about 30 years. In 94, I actually left San Jose and went to Fresno to work for the Catholic Conviction Center and I did some community organizing for them. And then I retired. When I retired, I started writing. And now I write and I play golf and I do this kind of presentations. That's what I do. The story of CSO, and the reason I had that picture <coughs> is because most people don't know how the United Farm Workers started. This is the Board of Directors of the Farm Workers. This here is Max Lyon, el único negrito que estaba en la mesa directiva. This is Marshall Kent, <coughs> the only Navajo that was in the mesa directiva. He's from Bakersfield. And the only Filipino is Philip uh, Veracruz. And then these other people all members of the CSO besides this one. This is a photographer, Peter. He's actually not on the board of directors. Uh, the, the one that was taking the, this picture was Jessica Govea. She was from Bakersfield and she was a member of the CSO in Bakersfield. 
she should have been there when she took this picture, so he got in there. This is uh, Richard Chavez, that's, that's his brother. He was the chairman of the president of the CSO in the Leno. This is Eliseo Medina. He's the, the current vice president of the largest service employee workers union in the United States. He used to be a member, and his family used to be a member of CSO in the Leno. This is Clara Hernandez. And Clara Dolores Hernandez, and what you know is Dolores Huerta. She was a member of the CSO in Stockton. This is Gilbert Padilla, my personal friend, and the one who talked me into writing this book. That's the, he, is, he was from the Hanford CSO. He was the president of the Hanford CSO. And this is Cesario. 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 We, we know him as Cesar Chavez. That's his name, Cesario. He was from the San Jose CSO here. And he was the vice president, the first vice president of the CSO Shepherd at San Jose at the age of 23. And uh, most people, when they talk about Laredo, the UFW, and those campesinos, and all this, they don't understand the connection. Without the training that this guy's got in CSO and Jesse here over back here, this would have never happened. The UMW would have never come about had the CSO not existed before. Because the people that actually became the leaders of the UMW were trained by this guy. This is a picture of the first convention that we had on in Monterrey. And uh, this is the first president of the CSO from San Jose. It's called Herman Gallegos. He's 23 in this picture when he was became the president of the CSO at the age of 21. Okay. This is Cesario, probably the only picture you'll find of Cesar in a suit and a tie. Pardon me, Senor Garza. What? I, di I didn't realize, but this class ends at 140, so it's only got about another six or seven minutes. You kidding? Yeah, sorry about that. He took me to lunch. He told me, like, I, like, we got time. Okay. <laughs> I am sorry. I apologize to you. As I all wanted to ask a question, Cleo. The CSO was a very important organization in Aquin San Jose, and they basically started the civil rights movement for all Chicanos in the state of California. And most of the leaders, national leaders and local leaders, came out of San Jose. As the, let me give you an example. This guy came from Hampton, but this guy here. It's from San Jose, it's called El Piñon. He was a national CSO chairman and he was a local chairman of the CSO here. He started and he created MAXA also. He was one of the board of directors at MAXA. He was always a UFW supporter. Este es Dilbert Padilla. De, 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 de. What you can do when you want to meet He's an eighth grade dropout from uh, Norvino Junior High School where he was a farm worker. In this particular place, he is the master of ceremonies after the march, the first march that the campesinos had to, to walk to Sacramento. Here in 78, 1978, he is talking in Geneva, Switzerland to, to uh, ¿cómo se llama? The, the, the League of Nations, ¿cómo se llama? The United Nations. Nations. United Nations. The United Nations. He's representing the United States and speaking on migrant farm labor and their plight to the United Nations. It's an eighth grade dropout. But what you can accomplish when you learn something well, you know, the Toltecas used to have four rules for you to live within the society. The Toltecas are even older than the Aztecs and they're even older than the Olmecas. If you know your history, they had four, four rules. One of them is always do your best at whatever you do. No matter what you do, do the best. And you will be all right. This guy was that way. And he did an excellent job, and he still does. A fantastic community organizer. And uh, these are community leaders that develop throughout the state, but I don't have time to get into them, but this is some from San Jose. Cesario, 
Cesar Chavez. It's right here from San Si Puedes, right there by Guadalupe Church. That's where he was, that's where he was working. In fact, he used to work at a lumberyard, located in all holy lumber, before he became involved with CSO. And uh, he went on and became the, the fantastic international labor leader that he became with, with the farm workers. Herman Gallegos, he was the first president of CSO, and he was Cesar's friend. At the age of 21, he was elected president of CSO. He had just graduated from San Jose State. He became a social worker. Then he got appointed to sit on the first. He was the first Mexican-American to ever be appointed to a foundation board in the United States. The Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation, he sat on those two boards after that. That's a fantastic honor. They allocate out billions of dollars every year. Yes. And then Al Pinon, I just mentioned him. He started the first language, Spanish language radio station at in San Jose. Before him, before 56, there wasn't any. No había radio en español aquí. He created the first one. He also was the founder of Baxa. Luis Arate became the first probation officer hired by the county of Santa Clara. And he still lives here in San Jose. He also created uh, the union for the yeah. probation officers in the state of California. If you should have a chance, you should invite him. He would love to talk to you. You know, like all these people came out of San Jose and they're very well recognized throughout the country. Herman Gallego started the National Council of La Raza, which is the largest lobbying group in the United States for Mexicans or for Hispanics now. He started that. He also started the Southwest Voter Registration Drive, which registered people to vote throughout the American Southwest every, every election. And they registered thousands and thousands of Mexicans of their vote. He was the founder and the first executive director of that. Vive, todavía vive. He lives in Stockton now. Retired. The CSO did a fantastic amount of work. And it was the first uh, organization that started that actually uh, did a lot of work. And actually, he, yeah, I know, he's got to go. And they did it very simply. The only thing they did when they started, before they got people organized, is, are oh, you registered to vote? Would you like to register? No, no, 